right. Great, guys. So glad. We're going to do something really cool this morning. I am live streaming this right now on Facebook so that everybody knows that you exist. Can you just say St. Henry's real loud on the count of three? You ready? Three, two, one. St. Henry's. And 12, right? Yes. Okay, fantastic. And um, if you want to find this, you can go to drewland.org. That is our Facebook site. You can also find on YouTube, drewland.org. If you want to rebroadcast, if you want to watch it again, or if you wanted to share it with your parents, however you want to do that, uh, we are live right now. So that's too cool, hey? And uh, I want to talk to you a little bit around fearing less. So I'm going to tell the guys right here. Uh, online, if, if you want to comment below your greatest fears, what's your greatest fear? And if you want to do that on the rebroadcast, tell us what your greatest fears are. Now imagine if you were able to conquer those fears. Now when I was eight years old, my brother, who was an inventor and only four years older than me, at 12 and made this hang glider out of wood and plastic sheets. I mean, the kind of flop in the air, not that plastic sheeting, but the one that flop. He makes this huge hang glider that's about 10 times bigger than him. So now he has the wisdom at 12 years old to know that it's probably not going to carry him. But it could carry his eight-year-old brother. <laughs> so he comes and he convinces me to try out this hang glider. We go to the top of our house, which is this A-frame house, and at the apex, it takes both of my brothers to lift this thing to the roof. They then mount it on my little shoulders, and they say, all you got to do is run down the roof and jump. <laughs> so like an obedient little brother, I said, oh, this is cool. So I put it on my shoulders. They, they help me, and I start running down, and I leap. Now, before I tell you what happens next, <laughs> I want to ask a few questions of myself at that age. Why would I do that? Was I insane? Well, no more than, than any other eight-year-old kid. Was I stupid? No doubt. I lacked a little bit of common sense. Was I gullible? Well, certainly I believed that my brother could do no wrong and that he could, he could invent anything, and if he did a hang glider, I'm sure it's gonna work. Was I fearful? Did I have no fear? Of course not. I was frightened. But there was a belief in me that overcame that fear, and it was the belief that I could fly. So I thought I could try, or I should try it at least. So I jump off of this thing, and as you can imagine, Seconds later, <laughs> and the whole thing falls apart. Now, I survived. <laughs> you weren't sure about that part of the story, were you? You're like, did he die? What happened? No, I survived. <laughs> I survived, but the hang glider did not. It's just this heap of rubble at the bottom of, our, of, of, of the garden. And my brothers come down off the roof, and they run, and he doesn't care that the thing is a mess, is a mess. His hang glider's broken. He doesn't even care that my face is like in the dirt. He just removes the rubble and he has one question. Did you fly? How was it? And I said, awesome. Awesome, it worked. For a split second, I could fly. We all know the famous quote by Nelson Mandela. I mean, we live in South Africa, so we've heard it so many times. He says this, I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man is not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers that fear. Now, the dictionary, it, it, it defines fear like this, an unpleasant emotion caused by the belief, that's a key word, the belief that someone or something is dangerous or likely to cause pain. So I like it that it hinges on the word belief because it means that we can have some beliefs that help us to fear less. 
And fear is like this, like this seesaw. And you know seesaws. You probably have been on one recently if you're, if you're still a kid at heart. I love them. I got a three-year-old kid, and he loves to be on the seesaw, and I love to get on the other end of the seesaw. And you know that cruel joke, but it's quite fun. You know, you just kind of like, you have him up there, and then you let it go. And then he goes, Whoa! I love seesaws. And the whole way that a seesaw works is that you got to load one side with more weight than the other side or to balance it out. And if you want one side to go up, you got to load it with something. Well, fear on this side has things such as, is this going to work? Questions like, is this dangerous? Could I get hurt? And the more we keep loading those thoughts when we encounter something, a difficulty or something that takes a little bit of courage, when we load it that side, it tips the seesaw in favor of fear. But imagine if we could have some convictions that outweighed those fears. Imagine if we can load it with something a lot more substantial than the what if questions. Because that's really all they are. What if? But imagine if you can load it with something on this side that just knocks those what if questions off the seesaw of fear and eliminates or at least helps you to fear less. Well, I've got three convictions that I think will help you conquer fear or at least fear less. Because the truth is, is that we... We don't want to just eliminate fear. Sometimes that helps us to think things through and make wise decisions. But we want to fear less, and we want the possibility of flying to be greater than the fear that would hold us back from attempting it all. Here are the three convictions. The first is this, is that you actually have what it takes. You have what it takes. You know, this is the question that you will wrestle with the, the rest of your life. We start at a young age asking the questions, do I have what it takes? And we're looking for people to tell us that we have what it takes. And we will start to, we, we will begin to question that. And for the rest of our lives, you will face things that will bring that question up in you again. Do I actually have what it takes? Now, I have a wonderful dad. He, uh, he, re he really was a good dad, and I know that I'm blessed more than most people are to have a dad like that. I often tell my kids, my dad is better than your dad. <laughs> and sadly, they agree with that so most of the time. No, they, they, they. But my dad really was amazing. One of the things that he did is he instilled in me this belief that I've got what it takes, and he did it with this simple phrase. He would ask me, Drew, how tall are you? No matter what I faced, if I was about to take an exam like you guys are in just a moment, your exams at the end of the year, you're facing, you're going to have to have courage for those exams. Whether it was an exam or whether it was a difficult person or a conflict situation or whatever it might be, even in the morning when he would let me out of the car on my way to school, he would ask me the question, Drew, before you go, answer me this, how tall are you? Now, there was only one answer to that question. I was only allowed to say one thing, and it was this, I'm 10 feet tall. I wasn't allowed to give my height, and we learned this at an early age. We started to give our heights, and he said, no, 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 that's not the right answer. How tall are you? And we'd say 10 feet tall, and our little shoulders would go back, and we'd walk to school, we're 10 feet tall. It was his way of saying, you are bigger than you think you are. You've got what it takes. And then later on, when I gave my life to God and I started realizing God is for us, there's a, there's a scripture that says, if God is for you, who can be against you? Then I really knew I'm 10 feet tall. Whoa, yeah, he's with me. He's like, got my back. And that understanding helped me to realize that I can't have what it takes. You actually have what it takes more than you think you do. In 2006, I had a, a little baby girl who was born. Now, this crazy story goes like this. We had just moved to Durban. We didn't know anybody in Durban. We booked in to have the baby at the hospital. My wife's eight months pregnant. But this is our number fourth, and we're thinking, hey, we got this. And I'm thinking, I got this. I can, I can, you know, I, we know the score. When she starts having contractions, we take her to the hospital. Easy. 4.30, sorry, 4 o'clock in the morning, my wife wakes up and is having contractions. She nudges me awake. She says, Drew, contractions are coming. Baby's coming. I'm like, okay. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. The baby's coming. Okay, the baby's coming. Okay. The bag was already packed. 
we're ready to go. She then goes and she starts getting ready, getting clothes on and getting dressed and everything to go. But she starts having this contraction and a minute later she starts having another contraction. Now if you know anything about uh, having a baby, you'll know that when contractions come at a minute apart, you're seriously close to having the baby. So I said, Megan, wait a minute. You're about to have the baby. We got to get in the car, get in the car. Now we have all these steps in our house. And so she's walking down every other step having a contraction. I'm saying, get in the car. <laughs> I finally get in the car and at 4.30 in the morning, we're racing through Durban and nobody's on the road. We get to the hospital, the place is empty. I go and I bang on the door and there's only a security guard there. And I'm like, bum, 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 hey, bum, 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 having a baby. He comes out and he's what? And I said, look, we're having a baby. He doesn't speak English. And I said, just, I said, <laughs> demonstrated and I just said ah, bah, ah, bah. and he disappears I run back to Megan I open the car door and she is, is now trying to have this baby in the car seat in the seat of the car and I said what are you doing I said we're right here go inside she says I can't the baby's coming right now I said no and then I said something that you should never ever say men when you get married don't ever say this word to your wife having a baby I said, come on, just, just suck it in. <laughs> she looked at me and said, what the heck? And I realized by the look on her face, that was the wrong thing to say. I said, okay, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm like, okay, I don't know what to do. I'm like a panicked. Now, now come on, give me some credit here. I was asleep just 30 minutes ago. You know, guys, I mean, we don't just wake up, you know, and when we wake up in a panic, we don't know where we are, what we're doing, and that was the case in this moment, and so I did the second stupidest thing that I've ever done. I think i got to make her comfortable, so I pull that little lever to help the seat go back, and she just goes flying back. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, baby, I'm sorry. And now she starts pushing, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is happening. And inside, something in me thought, pull yourself together. You can do this. You got what it takes. You're 10 feet tall. You're 10 feet tall. And I feel like I'm getting smaller and smaller. I'm saying, no, 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 no. You're 10 feet tall. You can do this. You can do this. You can do this. The security guard comes back. Sorry. Before he actually arrives, Megan starts giving birth. And I realize this is my moment. So, of course, I pull out my cell phone. <laughs> start live streaming it like we're doing right now. What's the stupidest thing you've ever live streamed, hey? No, I'm kidding. That was before live stream. I did not pull my cell phone out. I did not have the presence of mind to do anything but panic and catch the baby. And that's what I did. I caught the baby. And then I held her up. I held her up like, like Mufasa. Simba. And I'm just panicked, and my wife is like this super calm. She's like super calm. And she just says, just put the baby on my chest. And I'm like, uh, uh. She says, just put Drew, Drew. I'm like, hi, yeah. And I put the baby on her chest. And then we sat there, and we prayed for her, and it was just like this sweet moment. This is now when the security guard comes back in, and he's like, I don't know, whoa, 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 whoa. He like, sees it all. You know? He like, sees it all. Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. He says, they're coming. The nurses are coming. I said, it's a bit late. So I sit there and I, just, I start having a full-on chat with the security guard. Like, yeah, what's your name? Funlani. That's why our daughter's name is Anya Funlani. No, joke, it's not. We didn't name her after the security guard. <laughs> the nurses come. They wheel her into the hospital. Now get this, the worst part of it all. A hospital still charges me for the birth. No discounts, no nothing, how wrong is that? <laughs> but you know what, I had to, I had to have the courage in that moment, and I had to have the realization that uh, this might, I might be way out of my depth. But the reality is, is I did know a little bit about birth, and it might have just been a little bit, but it was enough to know that I can do this. And you know, you know more than you know. And you know what? Whatever you don't know, in that moment, if you will take the step, you will realize that you rise to that occasion. That's where courage comes from. 
Not from the holding back in, geez, I just don't know if I could ever make it. But with the conviction that, you know what? I've made it before. I can make it again in that moment. The second thing, conviction that you need, is the conviction that it's actually a small world after all. It's a small world after all. Did you know that Facebook, they've done the stats for us. Did you know that you're only, you're less than five introductions away from somebody that you don't know on the other side of the planet? There was a, there's a so, social science a term for that is six degrees of separation. It came out in 1929 where they realized that in the world people are only six degrees away from somebody else. Facebook realized, because there's 1.8 billion people on Facebook, how crazy is that? And Twitter also confirmed it in their studies and their connections of people that you're less than five people away. So some unknown dude in California is only five introductions away from you. You know somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody that knows, somebody that knows him. That's how small the world actually is. That's incredible when I think about that. That helps me realize that, you know what? I can actually influence somebody that I've never met on the other side of the world. That helps give me the conviction that actually I'm not the small little nobody in this huge world that I can never conquer and never do anything with. Actually, I'm the giant in this world. And that there is a giant in us that enables us, and even the connectedness that we have enables us to reach and influence more people than we ever thought possible. But there's another concept to this. It's a small world after all. And it's this, you know, I don't know if you know this song or know where that comes from. Have you ever heard Disneyland's It's a Small World After All? Da, 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 da. I can't remember the words. Da, 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 da. It's a small world after all. You guys know it? Some of, you, some of you, yes? See if you can hum it with me. Okay, that's pretty pathetic. Never mind. Scratch that. That song is part of Disneyland. Now, when I was 18, I went to Disneyland and for the one and only time I ever went there. And you come to this huge display, and there's about 300 automated little robots, and they're singing this. It's a small world after all, and they're all dressed in different uh, clothes from different countries around the world. And uh, the reason Walt Disney put that together was because of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Anyone study that in history here? Cuban Missile Crisis. A few of you? Sounds familiar? Okay. It looks like kind of like the grade 11s. Kind of, you've studied that recently, maybe. The Cuban Missile Crisis was something happening in the time, and Walt Disney was afraid that this was going to bring chaos to the world. And he wanted to display that actually we are more like each other than we are different from each other. So he put together the display and the song, and it's a statement that it's a small world and we are more similar than we are different. Now, I have lived in three different, on three different continents, six different countries. And I've visited over 26 different countries. And my experience can tell you that everywhere you go, people smile the same, people laugh the same, people cry, people have fears, people have dreams, people are just like you. They're not wiser than you. They're not, uh, you're not wiser than them. They are similar. Now you might know some more stuff and they might know some more stuff, but they are like you. It's a small world. We are more alike than we realize. When you realize that, you have the conviction to, re to, to, to think, actually, I can make a difference and I can step out and encourage because it's a small world, both numeric or, or connected-wise, in terms of physical, but it's a small world in terms of our hearts. Our hearts are similar. And if my heart's like your heart, then I can understand you and I can help to change you and I can help to impact you and you can help to change and impact me. We can have the courage to do great things. And then the last conviction that you need is to realize that failure is actually a myth. It's a myth. It's a myth. And this is what I mean by that. In my pocket, I have got a penny from the United States of America. And a penny has a picture on it of a president named Abraham Lincoln. Now, Abraham Lincoln is one of our most famous and probably most loved president of all time. He's the guy in the Civil War who helped write, uh, sign the Emancipation Proclamation and set the slaves free. He is absolutely loved and he was assassinated, which made him even more loved. 
Well, the thing about Abraham Lincoln is that there was a time in his life when he had a company that went bankrupt and his partner made some bad decisions, died, and left everything sitting with Abraham Lincoln. And it went bankrupt. And it took Abraham Lincoln 10 years to get out of the depths of bankruptcy. So although his face is on every penny in America, there was a day when Abraham Lincoln didn't have a penny to his name. And he rises up out of the ashes to become the president of the United States of America. But you know what? He's not the only one who did that. Four other presidents as well were in utter bankruptcy and rose up. One of them only paid his debt off and only three months later became president of the United States. William McKinley, Thomas Jefferson, there was many that have come through, but they're not the only ones. Henry Ford, complete bankrupt and came out of that failure to do Ford Motor Company. Hershey, you know Hershey's chocolate maybe here? You know Cadbury's, but Hershey chocolate, Cadbury's is better, just put it out there. And tell me if you think it's not. But Hershey chocolate bankrupt, Heinz ketchup, you know Heinz ketchup? Absolute bankrupt, a couple of years ago they, they just brought in $10 billion. And Walt Disney, who lost everything a few times and rose up out of the ashes. Failure is a myth because failure in itself is the opportunity to grow. Failure is that moment where you can build upon it. And now if it's something that you can take and build upon in order to have greater success and do better things, then how could it be a failure? How could it be something so bad? And once you start to understand this, you begin to realize that actually the failure would be to not jump off the roof with a hang glider when you're a little eight-year-old kid and the roof is not so high. Let me just throw that in there as a disclaimer. Children, if you're watching this, don't jump off a roof if you're eight years old with a hang glider. But do learn to take risks because it's in those risks that you actually get the opportunity to fly. And you're going to have risks all the time. And the question is, you're going to load the seesaw with what if this could happen? And what if this could happen? And what if this could happen? Or are you going to load it to this side? Saying, oh, no. But actually, I'm 10 feet tall. I've got what it takes. More than I actually know. And if I can believe that for a moment, I can start to see change and see risks as part of my life and not something to be afraid of. It's a small world as well. I can affect those across the world quicker and more instantaneously than ever before. But it's small because we're more like each other. I can understand and they can understand and we can take risks together. And then failure is just a myth. Even if I make the mistake, even if my foot slips, I learn now not to put my foot there again. And then the next time it gets even better and bigger. That's how you fear less. That's how you have courage. St. Henry's, thanks so much for inviting me. Thanks for having me. I'll be thinking about you, gonna be praying for you. How tall are you? Ten feet tall. Sorry, wait, wait, how tall are you? Ten feet tall. Don't forget it. Thanks so much. Thanks for tuning in. Guys, you really did welcome me so nicely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ah.